So this morning we're going to be talking about uh, the kingdom of God, continuing this series. And uh, so I, they started off with, I um, uh, just want to mention that um, um, I don't know if you heard or not, but in Vancouver, they've got a brand new department store. It's got six stories, six floors to it, and it's called the Husband Store. Anne Marie perked right up. <laughs> it's a place where a woman can go shop for a husband. And the store has six floors, as I said earlier, and in each floor there's different qualities of husband. And the higher the floor, the better the husband. So if a woman wants a better quality husband, they just need to uh, simply go to the next floor. But there is one restriction, and that restriction is this, is that once you choose to go to the next floor, you can't go back. All right? So, so you you got to make your choice. You can't go back, right? And so, uh, so, you know, when you come into the first floor, there's a sign that says, men on this floor has a job. <laughs> she thought, man, this is really good, Anne-Marie said to herself. And, uh, I, you know, this is, but I'm, but I'm wondering what's on the next floor. So she goes to the next floor, and she gets off the elevator, and there's a sign saying, men on this floor have a job, and they love children. And she thought, well, that's getting better, too. Uh, but I wonder what's going on on the third floor. So she goes to the third floor, opens a, uh, gets off the elevator. There's immediately there's a sign that says, the men on this floor have a job. They love children. And they're good looking. <laughs> eh? She thought even better, right? And uh, so, but curiosity got the best of her. And so she wanted to go see what the next floor had. So she gets off the elevator on the fifth floor. And, that, and there it was, the, the big sign, men on this floor have a job, love children, good looking, and they like to do housework. <laughs> wow! <laughs> this is really great. So, but you know what? She wasn't satisfied. She wondered what was going to be on the next floor. And there she sees this big sign. On this floor, these men have a job, they love children, they're good looking, and they like to do housework, and... They're very romantic. She thought to herself, how much better can this get? But there's one more floor. <laughs> and so she, she opens the door of the elevator, and there's a big sign that says, you are now the 3,261,462 and the 12th visitor to this floor and there are no men on this floor. <laughs> Which proves women love shopping and are difficult to satisfy. <laughs> uh, right beside the husband store is a wife store. On the first floor, are wives that love sex. On the, on the second floor are wives that love sex and cooking, and no man has ever went to the third, fourth, and fifth floor. <laughs> okay. I'm talking about the kingdom of God. <laughs> and I'm talking about parables, all right? So I just gave you one, and... Um, We've been, that's what we're talking about today, and, and uh, you know, a parable is just simply to um, illustrate, um, you know, uh, what God is saying, and uh, it's a story. And so, in, in fact, it's interesting, because in Matthew chapter 13, verse 34, it says, Jesus spoke all these things to the crowds of, in parables. He did not say anything to them without using a parable. So was fulfilled what was spoken through the prophet, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things hidden since the creation of the world. I find that really interesting uh, that, uh, you know, sometimes uh, in the church, we want to dumb down everything. We want to make it so simple. You know, Jesus never did that. In fact, he, he made people think. <laughs> and he made the people wonder. 
and there was a mystery about God. And, and when we uh, uh, come to God, you know, I'll tell you what, if you can explain everything about God, then you're God. You'll never know everything about God. God is beyond our understanding. He's, bi he's bigger than we are. And so he's a mystery. And, and, but it's this enjoyment of finding out who God is. And so God spoke to him in parables. And, you know, I'm going to give you a, some uh, definition of parable. Uh, and I'm going to give you a couple slides on that. But it's, a parable is simply a story to illustrate a moral or spiritual lesson. And uh, so we go look at this um, so in the um, a parable is a transliteration of a Greek of the Greek word uh, parabole. It means to place beside, to cast alongside. In the Vines Dictionary, uh, it says that it signifies a placing of one thing beside another with a view to com of comparison. Um, and another uh, 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 we, uh, Wearsby's uh, de description of a parable is. A story that places one thing beside another for the purpose of teaching. It puts the known next to the unknown so that we may learn. Now, parables can be just simply one-liners, like uh, um, you are the salt of the earth in Matthew 5.13. Or a parable could be uh, kind of a, a, just a real simple parable, like the lost sheep or the lost coin. And, and the parable that I'm going to use today is an illustration of the mustard seed. And, um, and Or it could be a narrative like the Good Samaritan story as found in Luke chapter 10. Now the parable uh, can also usually be identified by the use of the word um, like. Matthew 22, the kingdom of God is like a king who... And so I, I, in the next few weeks, I'm going to take different parables that God used. I, I'm doing this because Pastor Alex said to me, you know... Uh, Jim, it'd be really great if you would uh, speak about the parable. So I do whatever he says, and um, and so I'm going to be talking. Um, I'm going to be talking about the parables, and uh, but I want to use it as because it's amazing when you're reading through the Gospels. Just think, look at this. So many times Jesus said the kingdom of God is like, and then he told a story. And so that's what we're going to be looking at. It's, um, and so you can see it there um, on the screen, an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. And so that's what I'm going to be doing. Now, this, today's story, Matthew, um, the, uh, the parable of the, of the uh, mustard seed, is found in all three of the Gospels. It's found in, uh, in uh, Mark chapter 4, verse 30, and then in Luke chapter 13 as well. But today, we're going to be looking at it from Matthew chapter 13. And that's basically the same story in all three Gospels. And so here's the parable today. It says, Jesus spoke another parable. He put forth to them saying, the kingdom of heaven. And by the way, as we talked earlier, uh, the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God are interchangeable. I know that some uh, people have tried to make them two different things. But, you know, um, there's a really... Uh, there's not, there's not really good evidence that there are two different things. They're, they're simply spoken from a different perspective. Matthew is speaking uh, from the perspective that Jesus is the king uh, of heaven, and then, but in Luke he speaks, of, he, Matthew he uses the, king of, uh, the kingdom of heaven, and Luke uses it as kingdom of God. But basically there's the same meaning. So he says, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all seeds, but when it is grown is a greater than the herbs or than the herbs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. Now, how many know what hyperbole means? Jesus is using hyperbole. It means to uh, exaggerate, to make a point. And um, I like using hyperbole all the time, and my wife uh, corrects me. Jim, it's not that big. <laughs> I know! Because <laughs> it, it, obviously, uh, the mustard seed isn't the uh, smallest of all seeds. It, it, but he uses this illustration. He says it's the smallest of all seeds, and it grows into the largest of all trees. It's, 
the mustard seed tree, or the mustard tree, is not the largest of all trees, and the seed is not the smallest. But he's trying to make a point. He's trying to get the attention of the hearers, and he's teaching something that something that's small can grow into something that's large. And I think of the scripture in Zechariah chapter 4, verse 10, where it says, do not despise the day of small things. Everything starts with a seed. The genesis of all creation started with an idea, then a word, then the, the seed sprang forth and became fruitful. Look, I'll give you an example of this. You know, Jesus was uh, teaching, and the Bible says there was 5,000 men. There was probably 15,000, 20,000 people. And he said, let's feed them. And so look at this. First, there was an idea. Jesus had an idea. We should give them something to eat. Then he spoke the word, and he said, give them something. He, 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 his idea was expressed in a word, and then people scoffed. And they said, what are we, how are we going to do that? We, and, and, uh, and then he said, oh, we only got you know, two fish and, and five loaves of bread. So there was the word, first the idea, then the word, and then the seed, which is the uh, two fish and the, and the um, uh, five loaves of bread. And Jesus took this small thing. Okay, it's just like the mustard seed story. He takes this small thing, this, this couple of fish, five loaves of bread, 15,000 people. It's just ridiculous. It looks absolutely stupid and ridiculous. But he takes this, and because he, he wanted to teach them, he wanted to teach the disciples something about the kingdom of God. That the kingdom of God was not dependent on you and me. Isn't that great? And my great ability. The kingdom of God is not dependent on how much skill you have or how much ability you have or how educated you are or how smart you are. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. God doesn't depend on me. He is only dependent on himself. Isn't that good? And so he says, he says take this. These two fish and these five. And I'm going to show you the potential of a small thing, what it can do when it's in the kingdom of God's sphere. And so, he, as we know the story, there was 12 basketfuls left over. Thank you. There we are. <laughs> That's a mustard seed. Tree. That's a mustard tree, by the way. And um, so he took a small thing and it had great potential. And that is what, that is the, the, uh, the lesson that we can learn as ourselves. So why did, my question was, and I was, as I was meditating on this, I said, why did he use the mustard seed? I mean, he could have used lots of different illustrations on a seed. If you read the Message Bible, it uses a pine cone seed. I don't like that so much. Because um, I, I, there, there's a reason why Jesus used the mustard seed. Now, this thing, the mustard tree, grows from 2.3 meters to 10 meters. Now, how many know what that is? You know, I, it's funny, you know, in, in, in Canada, uh, if we want to know how high something or how long something is, we use feet. But if we want to know how much it weighs, we use metric. How many know that's true? Like, we're all mixed up in Canada. But 2.3 meters to 10 meters is about 6 feet to about 30 feet high. The span um, on the root system is exactly the same height as a tree. So the root system and is, is, is the same system as the tree itself. Now, I think this is significant. The root system and the trees above is exactly the same. And, and um, uh, this picture here, um, this is our, our beloved uh, Joshua and uh, Evans, and uh, that's yours truly there. Now, this is a tree that has fallen down um, in, uh, in Harrop. And this is a pine or a fir tree, I guess that is. 
And, uh, and I want you to notice the root system here. This root system was literally this wide. And it was, and you, I got my feet, and it's about uh, six feet to nine feet across, but this wide. Now that tree is about 100 feet high, and it fell over. It fell over because the root system was not significant to the tree. This tells me something. It tells us something about why Jesus used the mustard seed, the mustard tree, as an example. The root system on that mustard tree goes out exactly as wide as the what is above. And here's the, folk, tr the, here's the truth of this, folks. You can never grow and produce more than what your roots are doing underneath. So we think that, you know, like some people are, they're very shallow, but they're very wide. God wants us to go deep and wide. The disciplines that God has for us, the disciplines of, of, of Bible study, for example, having a, a, a daily Bible study and, and, uh, and uh, being part of a growth group in uh, personal disciplines like, you know, um, uh, proper uh, exercise and proper eating habits. And we may think these are all just, you know, uh, not that important. Or, or, or Bible meditation or, or, or Sunday, coming to Sunday worship and Sunday morning. These are all very important. Acts of service all contribute to the roots growing deep and wide. You know, I heard this statement the other day that... Um, God is not opposed to, um, grace is not opposed to effort, but it is always against reward. In other words, the grace of God isn't rewarded, you're not rewarded by extra grace from God because you worked hard. But effort is something that God blesses, and it causes our roots to go down deep so that we can actually produce the fruit that God has intended for us. Now, I looked at the fruit of this tree, and it's interesting. So the, um, the seeds of the uh, mustard seed, and I, I'm, t I'm sorry, uh, Pastor Alex, I'm not going to teach you on how to make mustard. But um, I was interested to see why Jesus used the mustard seed um, as an illustration. So the seeds are high in fiber and, um, and vitamins, of C, K, and A, and potassium, and selenium, and calcium. The seeds do not contain any cholesterol, so there you go. Isn't that good? No cholesterol. And uh, just a trace amounts of vegetable fat, there you go. Um, and a small amount of protein. And the uh, leaves are rich in phosphorus, calcium, vitamin B, copper, and magnesium. Talk about a nutritious tree. Not only that, I'm going to... Um, challenge you here now. How many can say this word? I love that guy. That guy's really smart. That guy right back there, he just said it right off the bat. And the other one is synegrin. Now, what these uh, properties do is they help prevent cancer, metastasizes, and, and uh, uh, possess antibacterial, anti-inflammatory, and antifungal properties. All in this mustard tree, and it helps protect against illnesses, diseases like cancer, arthritis, asthma, and hypertension. Now, I got thinking about this, and I thought, wait a minute. The kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. It's small, it's small, it grows, and is a source of life to the community. It is a source of healing. And it prevents decay in our society. Isn't that good? Jesus used this tree. See, 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 the kingdom of God, God intended the kingdom of God to be manifest. Jesus says if, that if you've seen me, you've seen the kingdom of God has come onto you. The kingdom of God is near. I'll tell you what, church, what the, the biggest problem is, here's, a, here's an uh, issue that I've had for a long time. I... Um, 
I uh, thought, I'm going to look up in the internet, because now you can find out anything in the internet. I wanted to see where the most Christians live, and I found this little place in Kentucky. It had about, you know, 30,000 people, and it had the highest percentage, something like 78% of the people in that town were born-again Christian people. And I thought, wow, that's awesome. Then I typed in another search question, and I said, what city has the most crime? And it was the same city. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. I said, wait a minute. How could you have the highest amount of Christians and still have the highest amount of crime? And there might be the reason is because the kingdom of God was never established in the city, but they had a lot of religious stuff going on in all the churches. Come on. Somebody say amen. amen. You see, God intended. To, I, I, the kingdom of God is not the church. God wants us to come into the church to, to be encouraged and to be strengthened and to learn and to, to experience God's presence and to to experience his healing and, 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 and help us to, to uh, do better in life and, and to grow in God. But then it's not ever any value <laughs> if it stays with me. So he uses this illustration of the seed now and this mustard seed because God intended that the kingdom of God should make a difference in the community in which he lived. Now look at this scripture. I want to uh, bring this scripture back up again because I want you to notice the green part. He said the king, the seed is so small but it grows into a mighty tree so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. Now if you read the Gospels, you'll notice that Jesus often used the birds as different illustrations and different concepts and ideas. But here, we in Matthew chapter 6, he says that God looks after the birds. God has intended that we, as followers of Jesus Christ, should be bringing the kingdom of God into the community so that the people in the community would find a safe place that they can rest and find security and find blessing and find healing in the branches of the kingdom of God tree called the mustard tree. Instead, we've made it something else. I want you to notice this, folks, in Romans chapter 2. And he's talking about in Romans, he's saying that, you know, every single one of us are sinners. Do you know that there isn't a righteous, holy person alive today or was alive back in the day of Jesus or before that? There's only one that was righteous completely, and that was Jesus. Now, spiritually, I'm righteous because Jesus... I've applied his blood to me. And because of his, what Jesus did on the cross, I am righteous. But man, you don't have to follow me around very long and you'll find out that when I walk through my everyday life that I sometimes uh, screw up. Sometimes, not very often. But notice this. You see, in Romans 2, you therefore have no excuse. <laughs> you who pass judgment on someone else. For whatever point you judge others, you are condemning yourself. Because you who pass judgment do the same things. Because you do who pass judgment do the same things. Now we know that God's judgment against those who do such things is based on truth. So when you a mere human being, pass judgment on them, yet do the same things. Do you think you will escape God's judgment? Or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, forbearance, and patience, not realizing that God's kingdom is intended to lead you to repentance? Oh, yeah, God's kindness. What did I say? God's kingdom? Yeah, I'm sorry. I repent. See? 
None of us are perfect. God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance. The kingdom is not about judgment. But so often we've made it that. Oh, man, the church is judging people and, and criticizing people, and, and the church is constantly, you know, like, I mean, if you talk to the people that are not in the church and give them a de um, ask them for a definition of the church, oftentimes you'll hear that, that they're a bunch of hypocrites and they're judgmental. And the Bible tells us clearly not to be. And so what, and the reason is this, is that we're all in the same boat. We're all in, there, we, we shouldn't be judgmental. But it does say this, the kingdom is not about judgment, but about reenacting and reproducing the same grace and goodness that we are experiencing. The kindness of God leads people to repentance. Oh my goodness, shouldn't we just simply be kind? The kindness of God leads people to repentance. Now, I, I, one of my favorite verses is this one here, is that in Acts chapter 10, you know, that, that Jesus, anointed by God, full of the Holy Spirit and power, went around doing good. The kingdom of God is like a mustard seed, and, 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 and even though it's small, it grows into a mighty tree, and, and, and it's just full of goodness, this tree. It's, it's got all kinds of healing properties in the, in the leaves and, in the, and the seeds are, are healthy and it provides shade and, and, and the birds of the air, I mean, uh, the most vulnerable, the birds of the air can come and find the safe place to nest. And could it, should it not be that way with us as a church that we would just go into the community and create safe places for people where they could feel secure and they could find the goodness of God in our midst. Jesus went about doing good, goodness. You know, the, the, the riches of his kindness, forbearance. How, you know, maybe that word we might not understand today. It, it simply means to be a patient, self-control, and restraint, and tolerance. Forbearance. Having tolerance, patience, using restraint, so, as I said earlier, their church is not the kingdom, but the place where we worship God. This is here we grow in knowledge and grace and develop our gifts and so we can spread the kingdom of God throughout the entire community. Reggie McNeil um, wrote a book called Kingdom Come. And, uh, and he said the kingdom of God, the definition, he uses this definition of the kingdom of God as the life the way God intended it. Life the way God intended it. I wonder if that's the way we are approaching our ministry. Life the way God intended. If, if, if that's going to happen, I, I want to suggest to you today that it starts here, right now, with you and me. And, you know, we might have a vision a dream, a desire, a spark. There might be something that's going on in us, but, but we may have dismissed it. Because you might say to yourself, I'm too old. I'm too poor. I, I'm, I'm not intelligent enough. I, I'm too short. I'm too tall. I'm too big. Nobody likes me. In short, you're too small. You're just too small. The problem is too big. And so you dismiss it. But I want to tell you today that faith is like a mustard seed. The kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. It starts with something small. If we simply would put our trust in the God who can do the impossible, the God who is majestic, the God who is awesome, the God who is magnificent, the God who can do miracles. If I say simply God, I know that I'm small. I know that I'm insignificant. I know that I'm not that educated. I know that I can't even pronounce uh, somebody could. I heard him say it. 
But God, it doesn't depend on me. It depends on him. The kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. And I want to tell you today, it simply starts with an idea. You may have an idea in your head. There might be an idea that say, oh, you know what? If we did this, this might be a great idea. And then you begin to, and then from an idea it starts with, or it goes to a word, and you speak the word. You think, you know what? Wouldn't it be a good idea if we did this? And then you water it, and you begin to, to examine it, and you begin to, to uh, uh, um, uh, tease it out, and you begin to see if this is possible. And all, next thing you know, the seed is starting to grow, and, and, and then it produces fruit, and there it is. It's growing. We've done that in our, 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 in our church. We had an idea to have a, a, a soup kitchen, to have a hot lunch program. And we began to speak it out, and then we teased it out, and, and, and next thing you know, we're doing it. And, and today, it's a great blessing to many, many people. We had the same idea with our housing project. And so now people are, 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 are in the housing project because we had an idea. And, and, and I tell you, uh, I had the city council people telling me that, Jim, it'll never work. You know, just give up on it. I had, uh, I had um, church people tell me, are you crazy? That's never going to work. I had um, um, just everybody. You know, I, we didn't have a lot of encouragement at the beginning. But it was a, a mustard seed. And I think to myself, what other ideas are out there that are simply a mustard seed? It, it, it might seem crazy at the moment, but I'm wondering how we can actually make our community a better place. I, uh, years ago, I had an idea that we should have street nursing. And I said to myself, you know, that the many of folks that, are, that are, uh, uh, are poor, they don't have a doctor, they don't have a medical uh, card, and uh, they, don't have, they can't, you know, they, they're, uh, they're maybe homeless, and, and they get some kind of an infection, or they get some kind of a hurt on their arm, and if, if people who have money can just, you know, go to their doctor, or they just go to the hospital, and they get it fixed, and there's no problem. They go, go buy some uh, polysperm, and they put a bandage on it, and boom. But if you're living on the street, or if you're homeless, and you may not have that possibility. And I thought, you know, it'd be a good idea to have street nurses. They could just uh, immediately fix that, you know, put some polysperm, put a bandaid on there, and they wouldn't end up in the hospital. And so I wrote a, um, uh, and uh, Interior Health put out a, up, uh, a grant uh, application. How, the grant application was how they could save money in the Interior Health and Medical uh, Services. And so I thought, I got an idea. Well, what about street nursing? So. Uh, uh, Anne Marie and I and a bunch of us, we spent a lot of time, about almost like 40 hours writing this grant. And I was so excited. I thought it was a great proposal. And we were going to get $20,000 and we were going to get, um, use it as a pilot project. And, uh, and so they sent me a nice letter after we submitted it and said, thank you for your submission, but we just want you to know that we've chosen another program to use for the $20,000. Uh, but we, uh, I thought, what? So then I called them and I said, what was wrong with our submission? Why, why did you not choose it? Well, they said, we actually knew what we wanted to use it for. We just wanted to see what other ideas were out there. I, I, I could, uh, it's one of those moments where I wasn't very spiritual. But do you know what's happening today? Do you know what we have in Nelson today? We've got street nurses today just came in a different way. And so we sowed the seed. <laughs> we put the energy into it, and it happened. It's happening. We have street nurses today. You know, we just finished celebrating St. Patrick's Day. How many know that was St. Patty's Day here a couple days ago? Did anybody notice? <laughs> it was St. Patrick's Day. And, um, and some of us don't know who uh, St. Patrick was, but let me just give you a, a little bit of a rundown. Um, he was actually a Roman. He wasn't an Irish at all. He was a Roman citizen, born in Britain in the 4th century to a wealthy uh, British family. Lots of money. His father was a deacon, and his grandfather was a priest in the Christian church. At the age of 16, he was kidnapped by Irish raiders and, uh, and taken as a slave to uh, Ireland. And there he spent six years working as a slave, uh, as a sheep herder. 
And during that time, he had an experience with God. And he was able to escape from the island and go back home, back to England. When he got back home to England, he decided to do some studying. And so he went to a monastery. And while he was there, he sensed that God was calling him to renounce his family's wealth and to return to Ireland. The very people that enslaved him, that brutal, brutalized him. And Ireland at that time had no expression of Christianity. There was no Christians, there was no church, and no support. He was like a mustard seed. And when he went back to Ireland, he suffered all kinds of persecution. Um, and, uh, you know, the, they exiled him on a little uh, uh, island off Ireland, and uh, he felt uh, shame, but he never gave up. He persevered. And eventually, uh, it is said that uh, the entire island of Ireland was converted. Oh, hundreds of thousands of people were baptized. I want to share with you his prayer. And, this, and he said, <clears throat> I am risen with Christ, though I through him I live today, I am bound to him. There where he is, there I am too. That which he is, that I am too. That which he does, that I do too. That which is subject to him is also subject to me. That which is obedient to him is also obedient to me. I live by the power of his resurrection. I live from his fullness. I live from all his blessings. I live from his righteousness. <laughs> Isn't that great? And then he says of Jesus, he says, He is before me and behind me. He is under me and over me. He is with me and in me. He is on my right and he's on my left. He is with me when I wake up in the morning. He is with me when the day is hard and difficult. He is with me when things don't work out. He thinks for me. He speaks to me. He sees me. I live today by the power of the heavens, by the power of the Holy Spirit. I love it. This was his daily prayer. And saints, the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. It is small of all seeds, but it grows into a mighty tree. Let's be like that. Maybe you're here today and you're thinking, well, I'm really insecure. I, I can't speak very well. Or, or, or I, you know, I, I don't have a lot of gifts. Or I, I don't have a lot of ability. Or, 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 or you know, um, I mean, I, I don't have any influence. And, and, and I'm, I'm just really small in my own eyes. Hallelujah. You're a perfect candidate. You're the best. <laughs> because you see, the kingdom of God does not depend on my great ability. It depends on God who can do all things. He just wants a willing partner. He just wants me to, to be walking alongside him, just like our friend St. Patrick. I'm going to invite the worship team to come. And, but it starts with us. It starts with me. And it starts with you. We can make a significant difference in our community in your family, in your home, wherever you are. They, and when, because of Christ in you, you bring his presence into that situation and God can take that which you have if you simply give it to him and he can make it grow into a mighty tree. I'm going to invite you to stand with me today. I want to invite you to, if you are here in this room or if you're listening online and you have never made a commitment to Christ, if you've never made a public decision to follow Jesus, you see, it always starts with an idea and then the word. And then we water it. 
And so the Bible teaches us that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised, raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Unless we make that confession with our mouth, we cannot experience what I'm talking about today. We cannot know the kingdom of God unless you allow Jesus to come into you. He is the kingdom. Will you invite him into your heart today? Will you say to me, Pastor Jim, I just want Jesus to come into my life. I, 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 wanna, I just want to do that. Would you, would you, you know, if you've never done that before, and, and you know, this might be a whole new concept for you, I'm telling you, you're in for a, a great ride <laughs> if you let Jesus come into your life. Would you just say, Pastor Jim, just, I, just by raising my hand, I, I, I want Jesus to come into my life. Would you do that this morning? Would you just, those of you who are online, just press the like button. Anyone want to put your hand up? Yeah, I see your hands going up. God bless you. God bless you. Father in heaven, I, I, well, let's just uh, pray for those that have lifted their hands. Lord, I pray, God, that you would honor their heart's cry right now. And Jesus, just pour life into those folks. You know, I said a, a few minutes ago that if we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart. And I'd like to invite our whole church and those that have raised their hand, I invite the whole church to repeat after me this simple prayer. So all of us will be saying it together. Say, would you say this prayer with me? Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive all my sins. Accept me now as your child. And I accept you as the Lord of my life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Listen, if you've never prayed that prayer before, and you prayed that with sincerity today, something miraculous is going to take place in your heart. Jesus will come into your life. Hallelujah. And if one more thing, we're going to sing a song right now, and sometimes it's just taking a step out. If, if God has been speaking to you about an idea, a concept where you can bring a blessing into the community, but you've dismissed it. Maybe it was born a long time ago, but you've, you know, you've shoved it down so far, it's hardly a, it's almost just like a, a, a wisp of smoke at this point. Would you consider resurrecting it? Would you consider saying, God, I'm your servant. I'm your, I want to be your, your, your vessel to, for bringing the kingdom, bringing some change into our community as you work through me. Is there somebody like that in this room? Would you say, you know, Pastor, that's me. I, I, I just, I want to do something for the kingdom of God. And if, if that's you, I want to ask you to do something bold. I want you to, as a testimony to God, step out of your seat and come out and stand right here and say, Jesus, I'm coming out standing here today saying, I want the kingdom of God. I want to be like a mustard seed. Now, maybe you've never, maybe that might be difficult for you. Well, that's good. <laughs> You could start right now. Why don't you do that right now as we sing this song? We're going to just say a little prayer over you. God bless you. Take it alive. Pastor Alex, and I want to just pray. I'm holding on to faith. Cause I know you make a way And I don't always understand I don't always get to see But I will believe it Yes, I will believe it You make mountains move You make giants fall You use songs of praise to shake prison walls and I will speak to my fear I will preach to my doubt that you were faithful then you'll be faithful now
I'm standing on your word I'm calling heaven down to earth And you will fight my enemies And this will end in victory And I will believe it Yes, I will believe it You make mountains move you make giants fall You use songs of praise To shake prison walls And I will speak to my fear I will preach to my doubt That you were faithful then You'll be faithful now You were faithful I know that I know you never will And I know that I know you never fail Yes, I know that I know you never will And I know that I know you never fail Yes, I know that I know you never will shake praise in walls and I will preach to my fear I will preach to my doubt that you were faithful then you'll be faithful now you were faithful then you'll be faithful now Before we start singing one of this last song, we're going to conclude our service this morning, but Easter Sunday, we're going to do a baptism. If you have not been immersed in water, you're missing out on all that God has for you. When, when Jesus went to get baptized, John tried to stop him tried to deter him and Jesus said this I don't need to be baptized but because he lived for us right he says I'm doing it to fulfill all righteousness saints of God water baptism fulfills all righteousness there's something that happens in the spiritual realm it is a physical testimony witness to the world that you're a follower of Jesus but they're in the spiritual realm. It is something significant. It says to the entire spiritual world that I now belong to Jesus and I'm in a different kingdom. I've come out of the kingdom of darkness and I've come into the kingdom of light. If you have not been baptized, Easter Sunday is your day. Mark it down. Let me know. Amen? Man, God bless you. That's it.